Okay, so good afternoon. Thank you for being here after such a long day. Uh, I think that uh, diversity is something that concerns all of us, uh, students, uh, academics, uh, people from industry. Uh, it's something that comes uh, in uh, up more often nowadays. Um, so today we have this diversity panel here, just briefly to present uh, uh, the panel chairs. It's uh, myself, Dimitra Georgiaru. I'm an associate professor at the University of Southampton in the United Kingdom. Uh, Shushmi Badulika uh, from uh, IIT Hyderabad, India. She unfortunately could not make it uh, due to visa issues. Uh, and uh, Sawana Tabasum from the University of Texas at Tyler, uh, USA, who will be chairing the session together with me. So we managed to have a very interesting uh, selection of panelists uh, with us today and quite uh, diverse, I believe, uh, because it's uh, diverse in uh, terms of gender, of uh, career level, uh, of um, ethnicity, if you like. So all these things uh, we will discuss uh, uh, with them uh, in the following uh, uh, minutes. So uh, just some brief introduction to know who is in front of you and uh, some uh, of their experiences so far. So our first panelist is uh, Professor Natalie Stingelin from uh, Georgia Institute of Technology and the uh, School of uh, Materials Science and Engineering in uh, the States. Uh, Natalie is a director of Georgia Tech's uh, Center of Organic Electronics and Photonics. Previously, she was professor of organic functional materials in the Department of Materials at Imperial College London in the UK. And she held a chair international associate uh, by the Excellence Initiative of the Université de Bordeaux in France. Pre she has held prior positions at Queen Mary University of London in the UK, Phillips Research Laboratories in Eindhoven, the Netherlands, the Cavendish Laboratories, uh, University of Cambridge uh, in the UK, and the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology uh, in Zurich, uh, Switzerland. Uh, currently, she is the Editor-in-Chief of uh, Journal of Materials Chemistry C and Materials Advances of the Royal Society of Chemistry Publishing Organization, and she was elected a 2021 Fellow of the United uh, uh, of the U.S. National Academy of Inventors, a 2019 Fellow of the Materials Research Society, and she's also a Fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry since 2020, 2012. Her research interests encompass the broad area of functional polymer materials, polymer physics, organic electronics and photonics, and bioelectronics. So you can already see a quite diverse uh, profile of our first panelist. Our second panelist is uh, Anna Maria Papas. She's uh, uh, as assistant professor at the Department of My Biomedical Engineering at Khalifa University in United Arab Emirates and the visiting scholar at Cambridge University UK. Prior to this, she was the Oppenheimer Research Fellow at Cambridge University and the Montslade Butler Fellow at Pembroke College. She, Anna, Anna Maria received her PhD in bioelectronics in 2017 from Ecole de Mines de Saint-Étienne in France. She is an associate editor in scientific reports, frontiers in, in electronics, applied physics letters. Uh, Anna Maria has received multiple awards for her research, including the L'Oreal UNESCO Women in Science Award, being listed in the Innovators Under 35 MIT Technology Review, and several awards in the area of an entrepreneurship and innovation. She is currently leading the Lab on a Chip Biosensors Group, focusing on developing cutting edge technologies for next generation miniaturized sensors with uh, applications in healthcare and environmental science. Um, Anna Maria represents uh, the early career academics uh, mostly on uh, this uh, panel. Uh, then uh, we have uh, the pleasure to have with us today Richard Harris from uh, uh, the Northeastern University here locally in the, the US, uh, our hosts uh, for this conference. Richard Harris uh, has spent uh, more than 15 years in industry as an engineer and manager and uh, joined Northeastern University in late 2002-2003. Uh, he is Associate Dean for uh, Diversity, Equality, Inclusion, Director of uh, Northeastern University Program in Multicultural Engineering, Co-Chair for the Center of Excellence uh, DEI Committee, and Affiliate Professor of Africana Studies. Richard is a member and official chapter advisor to both the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers and the National Society of Black Engineers. He is a member of the American Association of Blacks in Energy and a fellow of the Massachusetts Academy of Science. Some recent recognitions include the 2022 inaugural, inaugural Northeastern University Impact Award, uh, the 2019 NSB Minority Program Director of the Year, 
and 2019 NSB Boston Professional STEM Advocate Award. And so on, we'll present the rest. All right, so it's my pleasure to now introduce uh, Dr. Karen Panetta. So Dr. Karen Panetta received her BS degree in computer engineering from Boston University, and then her master's and PhD degrees in electrical engineering from Northeastern. She was actually reminiscing her old days at Northeastern here and how things have changed over the time. So we were discussing that before the panel started. And uh, she's currently the Dean of Graduate Engineering Education and a professor with the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Tufts University. And she is the director of the Planeta Vision and Sensing System Laboratory. Her research interests include developing efficient algorithms for artificial intelligence, simulation, modeling, signal, and image processing for ocean engineering, biomedical, and security applications. She has a long list of awards, and uh, due to time constraint, I can only cover some of them. Uh, so she was a recipient of the 2012 IEEE Ethical Practices Award and the Harriet B. Riggs Award for Outstanding Educator. In 2011, she was awarded the Presidential Award for Engineering and Science Education and Mentoring by U.S. President Obama for her Nerd Girls program to empower young women in STEM. She is the editor-in-chief of the award-winning IEEE Women in Engineering magazine from uh, 2007 to 2009, she served as the chair for the IEEE Women in Engineering, overseeing the world's largest professional organization supporting women in engineering and science. Uh, Dr. Karen is the CEO and co-founder of Tessera Intelligence, co-founder of CDEEP, and co-inventor of the first digital twin. She is a fellow of National Academy of Engineers, National Academy of Inventors, IEEE, uh, European Academy of Sciences and Arts, AAIA, NASA Job and AAAS. And next, uh, we just wanted to uh, do something different this time. We also wanted to um, invite a student just to share his or her perspective on diversity. Uh, so I'm going to introduce uh, st the student in our panel. He's Shah Zaid Riyam. He completed his BSc in Electrical and Electronics Engineering from Ratsha University of Engineering and Technology in Bangladesh in 2022. And he's currently doing his master's in electrical engineering at the University of Texas at Tyler, uh, Texas, USA. And his research interests include developing flexible and printed sensors and energy harvesting devices for environmental monitoring. Okay. So uh, that was the introduction to all our uh, panelists. And we'll get that. Okay, so first, uh, we are just going to um, start with one question from our side, and then we'll open uh, the discussion. Um, so first of all, we just wanted to know from all our uh, respected panelists, so if you can share your experience from, um, like, since you have worked in geographically different uh, locations and backgrounds and environments, so if you can share your own experience or perspective on diversity. And then we will uh, start with that, go from there. Yeah, first seat, first position, okay. <laughs> um, so, so I think it's important for me to also reference that I came to this country as an immigrant. I came from the country of Honduras, Central America uh, at the age of four. And so that presented a unique opportunity in terms of that generational transition where my parents really had a third grade education, my mother, and my father had a 10th grade education. Uh, we ended up living in Brooklyn. I grew up speaking only uh, Spanish. I couldn't speak English when I came to the country. Uh, believe it or not, I have no accent. And so that oftentimes will throw people off as to where my origins are. Uh, stayed as a US permanent resident till the year 2014. Believe it or not, from 1967 when I came to this country. And there's an interesting story about that. And, and I won't go into much detail but I had the opportunity and really needed to become a US citizen because up to that point, it didn't impede my ability to be an engineer, to be involved in unique areas of applications. I was working in hybrid microelectronics subassemblies uh, with several companies developing the AT&T 4x6 switch matrix, which became the Motorola flip phone that eventually became ubiquitous for cell phone technology. Uh, also working in your, your unique areas where I had certain levels of clearance, but obviously not top secret uh, clearance and so forth. But it was my son 
who actually went into my eldest son, who went into uh, cybersecurity. And so he came up through the ranks, electrical and computer engineering, found himself at the doorstep of a three-letter agency, is what I'll say. And that three-letter agency uh, really wanted to bring him in. Up to that point, he was working uh, for a company called Aerospace Corporation in D.C., Maryland area. And they came to looking at his background. And when they did the background check, they said, we cannot continue any further. And they said, your father is not a U.S. citizen. And because of that, they had to stop and pull back and told him at that point, he would need to wait until I became a U.S. citizen for them to potentially revisit that opportunity. And this was part of his dream. You know, he really wanted to become a cybersecurity expert with that three-letter agency. And so long story short, that's what really motivated me. Because uh, up to that time, I didn't need it per se, but it became essential in his journey and the ability to move into the spaces and places where he wanted to pursue. The last thing I will say is, is I've worked with uh, companies that are U.S.-based, but I've also had the privilege of working with Japanese Koretsu. Uh, which provided me a unique perspective and understanding that engineers do bring cultural context into how they develop different solutions for different problems, thereby knowing that there's more than one solution to a problem. And that cultural context helps to inform how one develops those solutions. And so that opened up a great opportunity for me in the context of moving from an American-based company in hybrid microelectronics subassembly to a company that recruited me to focus on organic photoconductors and developing that capability, eliminating the use of ozone depleting chemicals. If you remember back in the late eighties, mid nineties, George H.W. Bush, Papa Bush, as we used to call him, uh, required that we signed on to the Montreal Protocol. So this was a global commit. This was a global effort. And that's when I really had the appreciation for how we as engineers really do have the ability to impact globally what happens in terms of societal uh, needs and challenges, hence uh, the issue with the ozone layer. And so that for me became an opportunity. I traveled to Ireland, Cork, Ireland, every state in Massachusetts, developing new equipment, looking at new chemistries, looking at new processes, because there was nothing in place, if you remember. Maybe many of you might be too young to remember that. Um, but having said that, that gave me again an appreciation for how engineering and what we are now calling the empathetic engineer uh, really was starting to be developed at that time to understand how we could impact society for the benefit of society and look at what we used to do in designing and developing solutions, but not looking at unintended consequences. And so keeping in mind the unintended consequences and developing our human capital to their full potential, but to understand the connectedness, how connected we are, irrespective of where we are across the globe, that what happens in one area in many ways reflects what is happening somewhere else. And so for me, the journey was coming through engineering as a means to an end, and that end is broadly uh, identified, but having had the uh, benefit of, again, being an immigrant, going through that process, having an appreciation for what it was like for people that self-identified me in a certain racial ethnic identity, and then moving into that space and embracing it, but knowing that it also brought with it challenges. And so having the ability to move into this unique uh, journey uh, in uh, DEI really has allowed me to bring my live experiences, but also looking at the research that speaks to how we address many of these intersectional identities, whether it's race, gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, uh, and the list goes on. And, and so that's important as we move through this process, the intersectional identities. Thank you, Mr. Richard. You already have the phone. We'll come to that later, but we're ready here. Thank you. So now that we yeah, so as mentioned, I'm Natalie Stingelin, and I really grew up in the Swiss mountains. So actually, my parents have not studied. Uh, nobody in the family has studied. So when I wanted to go and study, actually even doing uh, the gymnasium, so quasi the high school, 
was for my parents actually very scary. They simply said, do secondary school, then, you know, go to a bank, whatever, in Switzerland. Um, but somehow my teachers really supported me and said, no, Natalie should go to gymnasium and then afterwards study. Uh, the weird thing is I wanted actually to become, I'm an accidental engineer, actually. <laughs> I did not really want to become an engineer. I was not even thinking. I wanted to become a marine biologist, but well, my parents not having studied, not knowing what's going on in case you do a scientific uh, career, they thought, why do you want to do marine biology in Switzerland? It doesn't really make sense. So eventually they convinced me to do something what they thought is practical, and that's engineering. Uh, so I went to ETH and looked around and first I simply thought, well, let's do mechanical engineering because people think we know what uh, mechanical engineers do. Um, but at that time, it would have been like 120 students, 119 male and me as a woman. So I was like, I'm not sure uh, if that works because I really come from a very small town in the mountains, Zurich already was like a big city for all of us and scary, not even talking about Brooklyn. <laughs> so uh, eventually uh, people said, why don't you do material science? It was just a newly funded department uh, at ETH, so the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology at that time. And I was like, okay, that could actually suit me. It has some chemistry, it has some physics, it has some engineering. And while uh, there it was 20 students, it was still 19 male one woman, but at least the ratio seemed a bit more uh, lenient. But also then I thought, well, material science is good. There's close by where I grew up, was actually a plastic uh, producer, a uh, producer of nylons. Uh, so I thought, well, I do my engineering degree and just go and work there, uh, keep the mountain biking up. But again, I had a mentor, my pitch, uh, my, my master's supervisor. He said, Natalie, you should do a PhD. So when I went back to my parents and said, oh, I want to do a PhD, they said, what? Uh, well, when do you really start working was essentially uh, their comment. I was like, okay, but you know, my professor thinks it would be a good thing for me. And then it just, well, it ended up that I did the PhD and after the PhD, a postdoc based on a Swiss National Science Foundation grant in Cambridge, UK. Um, so I spent after that a bit of time in Holland, uh, in Philips research before then, I have to say, I didn't like the management. So that's why I went back to academia, but there was zero plan. My plan was never to become an academic. I, I never even thought or dreamt of becoming a professor. So it was just thanks to mentorships. And I have to say it was always male mentors that I ended up where I ended up, even my move from Imperial College London then to the US, it was senior uh, colleagues who said, Natalie, why don't you try the US, you know, come over, let's have a look. And well, here I am. And where I'm really very passionate about is to give back this mentorship, especially also now being a woman, help younger women scientists, already from the PhD, uh, even before the PhD, really what can happen when you actually follow the pathway? Because for me, I had no clue. I mean, nowadays you see the students, they nearly overthink their career path at the first day when they start. And I sometimes tell them, listen, I mean, I never really thought, <laughs> but I was advised and I was very well advised. So it really showed me what good mentorship actually can do. And that's one of my big goals, especially in the position I have now to support, uh, not scare, especially younger scientists away from science, engineering, and uh, make sure that they enjoy if they go out to industry or in academia, I've seen both. And uh, like you said, enjoy, have also the, the fun of the engineering part while also doing something good for the world. Okay, good evening, everyone. I'm Karen Panetta, and I graduated from Northeastern with my master's and PhD. I did it both part-time while I worked full-time. I was born here in Boston. I went to school in Boston, 
And unlike Richard, you know, I am not an immigrant. I am a U.S. citizen, but I do have an accent, I am told. <laughs> so I, um, I really am an accidental diversity champion. I went and worked for a computer company called Digital Equipment Corporation after getting a computer engineering degree. And I thought, well, computer engineers, we design computers. So I did that for a while. And then I thought, well, it's got to be more. And I didn't know what that more was. So I said, let me try a master's, a PhD. My father really wanted me to be a civil engineer, you know, and um, I failed him miserably in that respect. So, but it, the, the interesting part was I decided to get a PhD if I could pass that horrible qualifying exam here at Northeastern. I hope it's changed, but I gained 35 pounds studying for it. And I made a deal with the Almighty that if I passed, I would go back and give back to be the professor that I wanted to be and to help students. So I did that. I passed. And I was the first woman hired at Tufts in, the, in engineering. And, um, and then they said to me, we're hiring you because we want you to be a mentor for women and you better be a good teacher. I was like, okay. Um, I had never taught. So I thought that was interesting. And, I, and, and when I got there on day one, there were no women except for me. So there was no one for me to mentor. So I decided that to you know, start a program to try to recruit it, women from other other disciplines to come into engineering. So I did that and I started through a program called Nerd Girls, which took off. And the whole concept was not just about getting a group or a team together to work on common projects that had benefit to humanity, but also in embellishing their research skills. A lot of programs that I see teach women and students, well, you can do outreach to younger generations. We did that too, but I didn't want them just to think that they could just do teaching roles. I wanted them to know that you can be the CEO, you can go out and get the PhDs. And to this day, 90% of all girls and individuals, I'll say individuals because it became very popular for underrepresented uh, represented groups of my male minorities as well, came into the group, 98% of them received a graduate degree within three years of graduating. So that, you know, blows away the standards of the, the standards of all the programs. Um, and so that's how I got into the diversity championship. I then went into IEEE. I've been a, I got all my training, my leadership skills through my professional organization. And I, I got to lead committees but I also had the opportunity to lead the world's largest organization supporting women in technology. And that's where I got to travel around the world. So I had never left Boston. And then all of a sudden I was traveling everywhere. And that's where I got to reach out to communities, meet students all around the world and, and encourage people to go into engineering, regardless of what they thought their grades were, what their skills were, what their parents' upbringing were. Uh, and, and also the cultural barriers too, because like Natalie, my parents wanted me to go sell cosmetics at Macy's or become a school teacher. So fortunately, my father knew I had expensive shopping habits. So he said I needed a degree that I could support myself. So he picked my engineering field. I really started the Women in Engineering magazine because as I traveled around the world, I heard stories from everybody and they all were very similar. And everybody thinks I'm the only one that experiences this as a underrepresented person or as a woman or as someone in academia or even as a student with faculty. So I've worked a lot to help graduate students navigate the, the behind the scenes, understanding how faculty think, how to be successful, how to negotiate, giving them life skills so that we can really have wonderful synergies and create and innovate wonderful research. So I'm very happy to be here and to answer any questions you have tonight. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Anna Maria Papa. Uh, I was born and raised in uh, Thessaloniki in Greece. And my story is a bit boring compared to the rest of the stories. Uh, I always wanted to be an engineer and I'm, Okay, I didn't want to go to academia, but of course, uh, you know, random decisions in your life, uh, it's not always planned, uh, can define your path. So I finished my undergrad studies in, um, in Greece, 
And then uh, while I was doing some work in the lab, I met my uh, future uh, PhD advisor who was on sabbatical in that lab. And um, I really liked her as a person. She was working on a field that I hate. I like electronics, cables. I hated it. And uh, I asked her if she has any positions in her group. She's told me that the, the project is with transistors and um, device physics. I'm like, I'll do it because I want to work with her. It's fine. So I embarked on it on a very difficult journey where I had to do something completely out of my comfort zone, work with cables. But uh, it went all right. And uh, during my PhD in France, um, because she was based in France, I it was a multidisciplinary. So I had to, uh, by the way, uh, her name is Rosie Owens. It's, it's not nice to talk about someone without mentioning their names. So amazing mentor. Um, so during my PhD, I worked with uh, clinicians, I worked with um, physicists, uh, engineers. Uh, it was really a multicultural uh, and, and uh, multidisciplinary environment, the lab. And uh, I learned a lot of things. I managed to, 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 to understand how the cables work. And uh, in the end, I managed to get a PhD. Uh, in that field, and um, it was actually great being able to work with uh, th in this diverse uh, environment in terms of um, scientific fields. Uh, of course, in France, the group was also diverse in terms of ethnicities uh, and gender, so it was a really um, uh, a good experience uh, for me. Uh, so then, um, for the last uh, year of my, for the project that I did in the last year of my PhD, I won this L'Oreal Award, and this is how I entered the um, diversity uh, journey and um, supporting uh, women in science. Where, to be honest, I think diversity is is a huge uh, field. It's not about only women in science; it's about diversity in general. Uh, so I'm going to be very general on uh, today on those uh, things. And uh, yeah, then I moved to Cambridge uh, with the mentorship and support of excellent people. Uh, as Natalie mentioned, it, that's like a crucial part in uh, someone's in, in a young in 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 someone's journey at um, at the early stages. Um, I managed to get to where I am, uh, which would be impossible without the support uh, and the trust network that I had built. And so I'm really grateful for that. Another part that really defined me was when um, during my postdoc, when my phone rang and it was from my ex um, high school. So it was a, a professor I had there, a teacher, and he's like, uh, do you remember? I'm like, of course I remember you. Yeah, we would like you to come here and talk to the students, do some STEM courses, classes, and uh, try to show them about new technologies, etc. So I did that. It was really, really um it was such a nice moment to go back to your high school and talk to students. Um, it was as if uh, a day hadn't passed for me. And um, that moment really defined me. Um, and since then, I knew I want to follow academia because I really wanted to educate, uh, not only educate, but also mentor in a way, uh, younger uh, students. And then uh, life got me to Middle East. Um, it it was uh, it was um, a, a really conscious decision because um, I, I really wanted to uh, explore uh, these areas and also um, give back um, in terms of mentorship and education uh, to people there. Um, the United uh, Arab Emirates also a very good model, uh, very progressive, and uh, I'm very uh, happy that I'm able to. Um, to mentor and um, um, work with um, female and male students, uh, both local and international. Uh, it's been a life-changing experience and um, uh, a lot of um, beliefs and um, um, my, my whole way of thinking has changed. What I have understood through that is that Sometimes we say diversity is important. I'm sure all of you agree that diversity is important in science, of course, but acknowledging and understanding is, is, is something that we are maybe all there. It's very important to be on the understanding part, but acceptance is what we really need to work on because acceptance means 
genuinely accepting something and not have to think twice when you talk to someone about something or um, when you interact with someone. It just doesn't come to your mind that uh, they are even different than you. You understand? So it's like it's it's um, it's really important to to become a part of a certain uh, of different societies and accept uh, differences uh, and be able to honestly and genuinely interact with them. Hello. Uh, firstly, I'm absolutely delighted and humbled to sit at this table with this esteemed scholar. Uh, I am very young, like uh, I graduated my uh, honors degree from last year, so I don't have much story to tell. Uh, but uh, that's an interesting uh, part of my journey to come to US. I will just share here, like uh, when I graduated from my uh, undergrad university, I told my parents that uh, that I'm going to uh, do higher studies abroad, like in US or Canada. Oh, then uh, my dad says, no, son, uh, sit for the public service. Uh, uh, there's a public service uh, exam that uh, is held in our country. So everybody likes that job. So my dad told me that, no, you have to sit for that exam. And somehow I managed to uh, turn my dad's mind and come here now every day. Uh, so uh, just today I uh, called him in the morning and I showed him like uh, where I am now. And uh, with... Uh, who am I speaking? Um, I'm mean, speaking to listening to. I'm listening to someone, uh, some great scientist of uh, this field. And my dad is like, yeah, <laughs> that's great to know. But yeah, just do fine and uh, try to reach the, that position in future. And that's it. That's my. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we open the floor for some discussion with the audience. Is there any particular you'd like to ask? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks actually for the topic. I was uh, uh, surprised by the something that uh, means a lot to me. So thanks for uh, organizing <coughs> this, uh, uh, this beautiful panel. Uh, I wanted to ask you by your experience, do you feel that sometimes concerning the uh, positions you found uh, are you in, in exception or it, 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 it's something that you feel around you is becoming more and more common uh, as maybe a woman or, oh, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so do you feel like uh, it's an, uh, an exceptional situation that you reached or an exceptional position as women or immigrants or something like that? Being an immigrant myself, I also understand that. And uh, did you also feel like you had to make much more efforts to, to reach that position and uh, for the general uh populations that maybe you, you represent is there some sort of glass ceiling that you have to overcome or is there a glass ceiling that uh, uh we still are not able to go beyond i'd be happy to start to answer that because people always call me a pioneer and i say no i'm more of a warrior because i had a fight that i to convince people i when i showed up the first day i showed up in a pink suit with high heels and i was the only woman so immediately there was this what is this and so the the way you look i found was also a stigma or a stereotype so the base is not just who you are or your gender but how you dress also so that was one thing but then i also found that there were low expectations you know you'll never get a grant you'll never get this then I got the, I got a NASA grant. Well, that's NASA. You didn't get an NSF grant. Well, then I got the NSF career award. Oh, well now I can work with you. I mean, I, I, I kept hearing over and over. And when I walked into, I said, I got the NSF career award. Yes. But how many journal papers do you have in IEEE transactions? And then when you go to promotion, well, you need to be an IEEE fellow. It was like, but, but, but you're not. <laughs> so, so I kept finding more and more things that, that, that I needed, that they kept saying I needed. And really, you don't need them. It's just, it's just their way of saying I need external validation that this person really is, is who they say they are, that their work is valid. And, you know, the position that I am in now, 
um, I, I work very hard to make change. And I have found that there are two things that people don't like. It's the way things are in change. So, you know, when you affect change and you do it rapidly, that's, people are very uncomfortable. I mean, she mentioned, you know, being uncomfortable. People are very uncomfortable with change. So if it's something they're not used to, I find that they, you have to connect and socialize with them, that you're not a threat, that you really want to help them. You're not competition. Sometimes you are, but at the same time, you know, you, you shouldn't diminish yourself just because to make them feel better about their work. So um, is it changing slowly, too slowly, way too slow for me or, you know, for all of us, I would say. And then when you do get in one of these positions, um, I've actually had people say, well, you're only here because you're a woman. You only got that because you're a woman. And, and that's, that to me is like, well, that's not true because I work 10 times harder to get it, but it's still a very slow in progress. And I'm sorry that I have to give you that bad news. <laughs> Maybe my colleagues will tell me it's changed. No, I fully agree. And actually, I like what you said about the clothes. As you see, I have yellow nails and I do that really on purpose. I'm now the chair of the School of Material Science and Engineering. And I really feel we have to become modern. We should not have a stereotype how a researcher should look like. And maybe that comes from a bit of a, my paranoia. I, Switzerland, but for instance, also German science, or when I lived uh, in Holland and Philips, I, those people who know me know, know I have about 100 heads and I like to wear heads. Today I was behaving. And so at Philips, also people said, ah, we at Philips, we don't wear heads, we don't wear skirts. And I was like, well, I do. Uh, and at that time, then at, at the, about two years I was in Philips, I had one of the big, I gave, the, the our bosses the management actually which i didn't like they decided i should give a very prestigious talk at phillips because i had very nice results and everybody was like why why is she giving this opportunity the reason was i was working all the time i, I mean it was i was an early career researcher in phillips i was used from cambridge you just work you write you write nice papers and that's why i was picked it was not because I was wearing hats or because I was wearing skirts, but I, I feel it's very important now also as chair to give younger women researchers and people from other diversity, also religion. I mean, we do science and engineering, the way we dress or whatever should really not matter. And too often, definitely, I think here in the US maybe less, but let's say if you go to Germany, Holland, Switzerland, you are very much judged the way you dress and, and the way you behave. And uh, I fully agree. I mean, the ceiling is still definitely not broken. Too many people still have a bias simply because you're from a, di from a minority group, you are different. And the acceptance that uh, I was talked about the understanding, but it's really the acceptance. We have to work on it. And I think, yeah, people like us uh, can hopefully pay, pay, yeah, get the way that people learn to be acceptance and not have one cliche how one has to behave, one how one has to dress, etc. Is there more we can do? Well, definitely, I think you have to lead by example. But unfortunately, the truth of the matter is there needs to be systemic change. And individuals can't bring about that systemic change by themselves. There has to be an intentionality. And part of that, I think all of you are aware that SCOTUS, the Supreme Court of the United States, has just recently made a decision after 48, 50 years, which was precedent, to disavow that precedence in order to address this system that has created this, this, these disparities. And so fundamentally, while we are leading by example, the truth is, is the system needs to be able to change in order to create the kind of dynamic, transformative and sustainable change that we have to get to, or else we're gonna lose the minds and the resources of 
human beings who may have the solution, but because we haven't allowed them to develop to their full potential, we've lost that opportunity. And so that's, I think, what drives, I think, most, if not all of us. And one thing is, even as an African-American perceived male, um, you know, when I was working on the uh, elimination of ozone depleting substances, and that was in our operations in Maryland, California, DC, Cork, Ireland, Canada, and so forth. When I would present, there was always an engineer who happened to be white man who would question and challenge my ability to bring uh, a framework that would talk about the uh, research that was done in order to build the reliability of this replacement that we had to come up with because there was no uh, uh, alternative to take off the shelf, if you will. And I, I was going to also jump in there because there's another kind of bias that's out there. I'm a graduate dean. I see all the applications that come in. And we talk, you just talked about opportunity and uh, all these populations. Well, 80% of low-income populations go to community college first. And when I see faculty saying, well, oh, they went to community college. They didn't go to the designer brand name institution. That says I'm filtering out all these people and I'm limiting it to this 1% schools of the, of the United States, not even all the other schools outside the country. What kind of diversity and what kind of innovation does that bring? Equitable access. Equitable access. So, so we've developed, and as you have, and I'm sure others, you know, NSF does a great job of providing funding opportunities in the case of uh, community colleges, creating these um, minority serving institutions, Hispanic serving institutions, HBCUs, tribal council universities, which are the indigenous uh, nations in order to be able to move the needle. But the challenge is, it's like startup. It gets you started, but it doesn't keep you going. And so that's the double-edged sword where it's great to have that initial funding, whether it's 5 million or 10 million that we've secured, but in order to have the sustainable, in order to create the systemic change, we have to be able to see commitment and investment, not just from uh, an NSF or an NIH or uh, a DOD and so forth, but from government and industry and corporate partners and foundations that understand this value proposition. We, we are losing ground. We are losing ground. And, and so that for me, I think is, is um, an important part that the journey is one that we have to continue to push forward. So it, it is interesting that we're always in this space of having to prove ourselves defend ourselves, and then uh, get the validation, as you talked about, uh, from somewhere else. Um, just a little context. I'm an undergrad student at the University of Dayton, and I'm the diversity, equity, and inclusion chair for student athletes there. Um, You've all been on a lot of different campuses. So I was wondering if you know of anything that students do on your campuses or that you think would be beneficial for students to do to support each other or like initiatives that can happen on campus. Well, if I could jump in very quickly, um, you know, I think developing the kind of ecosystem that's broadly, again, uh, diverse in terms of the intersectionality of identities, we have SACE, the Society of Asian Scientists and Engineers. We have the Society of Women Engineers, National Society of Black Engineers, Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, OSTEM, Out in STEM, LGBTQ, and those are recognized. But what sometimes students don't appreciate is the power of their voice and their ability to bring those uh, efforts forward so that someone like myself can then step in and provide the support it's harder to drive it from the faculty administrative side versus if students develop the opportunity and see the need, then that provides us with the ability to champion and advocate and then create that kind of ecosystem that supports the students broadly based on their needs and interests. And I'll just add that when uh, the, the, the um, problems happen in Iran with the women, um, my female Iranian students came to me and said, 
you know, this is wrong. You've got to get the university to make a statement. And I said, a statement is this one thing. What can I do? Tell me how I can help you. So I got them services. I helped them connect with families and uh, communications, uh, extra counseling, because they were telling me they had to wait two weeks to get in a counseling appointment. So I got them uh, group counseling. I got them individual counseling. I got them other resources. So, but I wouldn't have known what to do for them unless they helped me understand as someone in that position. And we've done the same thing for um, for our Ukrainian students with families over there, uh, in, you know, that that were in this horrible predicament. So I'd like to follow up on the comment that, as we've seen from recent developments, uh, basically losing ground, <clears throat> what type of strategies uh, do you recommend in the face of uh, sometimes seemingly increasingly challenge, increasing challenges as opposed to decreasing challenges? I could start again. Uh, one thing I would have to say is we've been here before, uh, unfortunately. Um, and so uh, in terms of the context of the United States, um, in terms of the context of post-slavery, in terms of the context of reconstruction uh, and the dismantling of what was put in place to address the disparities, the inequities, uh, putting in place opportunities for uh, dis- um, Mar are marginalized individuals at that time, primarily African-Americans, in order to be able to get into government, so assume positions of leadership, all of that was taken away, right? And we know about supposedly the Brown versus the Board of Education, separate but equal. And so we've seen this before, we've been here. The challenge is for us to, I think, become more astute and strategic and not become reactive but proactive. And I think there has been some sense that we've been progressing as a nation, but the backlash that those in my space have seen that equates with reconstruction, post-reconstruction, believe it or not, was the election of President Barack Obama. And so that set the stage for certain groups to realize that they needed to establish a counter offensive to address what they felt was an assault against what they perceived as this uh, right of white supremacy, just to call it for what it is. And so what we've done is AAAS, uh, ASWE, uh, and other organizations are collaborating to understand how do we address those state by state challenges? Because what's happening is they're going after each of the states now. And so while the Supreme Court has opened up the opportunity, which you start to see is each state is starting to in develop their anti-DEI model. So some individuals can't even have an office of DEI. There won't be the opportunity to even pursue grants where that supports it. So I, so I think we need to be careful in not thinking that this is a one uh, uh, occurrence. This is a series of steps and we need to be looking at how do we proactively prepare ourselves for that. The last thing I will say, normally we have, and I will blame myself for not doing this, a land recognition statement. Whenever we have an event, the purpose for the land recognition statement is to make sure we acknowledge the lands upon which we stand were those of indigenous peoples for over 10,000 years. And now we have the benefit of those lands, but we could not deny that they no longer have the rights of their lands. And the historical context, and I'll finish, is because of what's called the doctrine of discovery. There was an 11th century papal bull that was launched that said anywhere, anywhere that, uh, how can I say, uh, sailors or travelers from European nations went to indigenous areas they would now have the opportunity for title of the land 
although there were others there because those others only had right of occupancy, like deer, like rabbit, like fox, but they don't have the right of title. And so as recent as 2007, the Seneca Nation wasn't even aware that this was used in jurisprudence, American jurisprudence, to cite an 11th century papal bull to deny them the right to at least secure their lands. So again, the knowledge is important that we understand these have, have not just come about recently, and there are systems in place that allow this kind of ongoing perpetuating, and it was Ruth Bader Ginsburg who cited that decision. And she said it was the one decision she regretted in her life before she passed. And she cited the 11th century paper of the doctrine of discovery to deny the Seneca native uh, Indians or tribes in New York state from at least challenging the right to some of their lands. So that's how insidious this, this challenge is. And we need to be very intentional in how we understand the historical context that we've been here before, but how do we address it now? Because we can't afford to go back any further or else we suffer as a people, as a, as a, as a, as a, a, a hu human race, because we're losing the human capital potential of individuals who will not be uh, developed to their full potential. So. Yeah, and even uh, outside the const uh, well, in the context outside the U.S., I mean, the anti-DEI you mentioned. I I'm not sure if you heard about the recent event, possibly now only like ten days ago, where a Nobel Prize winner suddenly mentioned that he feels like discriminated. I mean, it's a very senior, obviously very established uh, white researcher, white male researcher, but. He in an interview, it was a panel discussion, he complained that, you know, there's now discrimination and, and possibly similar people worked here in the US to reduce, well, which led eventually to the affirmative action. So how, how to actually counterpose that? It's very difficult, but I think it's like Maria said, I think we have to really not only push for uh, diversity, but really also like in different cultures, really try to get understanding and acceptance. So I think people sometimes don't understand what diversity brings. Clearly a Nobel Prize winner is certainly not discriminated. Uh, I mean, this person has three groups around the world. He can definitely not claim that uh, he's lesser treated than other scientists. But it's the thought, so we really have to find ways to actually have discussions with uh, individuals like this person, because obviously also he has a very big uh, platform. And when he says so, I mean, other people will mimic. Uh, and that's then scary because that will push us even further behind because then suddenly uh, everybody feels discriminated and we should actually simply find pathways to illustrate that actually diversity is important for various reasons. Uh, it's not just numbers as too many people unfortunately think. It, it enriches all the environment, et cetera. But that's really a big fight and as now the US also showed, it's currently a fight where we use actually grounds. The only thing I would ask then is if there is the effort uh, to look at, as you just talked about, how do we look at studies that McKinsey, uh, the Federal Reserve of the United States and others have done to look at the value proposition of uh, diverse uh, groups in business. And each time they've shown that the diversity of identity brings about diversity of experiences which then ultimately brings about diversity of thought, leading to more innovative solutions than might otherwise be seen from a homogeneous uh, group uh, going forward. And, but getting that conversation going, and, and it's not a zero sum game. And that seems to be the perception that if this group gets more, then that means less for me. And, and that's not where we should be because the opportunity of growing, uh, again, innovative, 
uh, impact, uh, uh, collective impact as we call it, is such that it does not look at this as being a zero sum game. That one is losing and the other one is gaining. It's the collective impact of how it benefits us globally in society. If I may add one thing here, <clears throat> based on that, is that I hope that in the future, it won't be about one group getting this, the other group getting that, the other group getting something else. It should be something natural, everything based on merit, but not really identifying differences in the sense of, okay, so why grouping people together? And this is actually, I think, the stage where we need to not only understand those importances, but accept and then um, genuinely uh, coexist in an environment and move forward. So there shouldn't be at some point the, this group, that group, the other group. We are all people. We are all passionate about something and we all do our best towards a certain goal. So this is my opinion. Mm -hmm. So I hope that sometime we will reach this stage. I have one very burning question. So do you think that diversity could also be challenging sometimes because of lack of communication between uh, people? So if they're culturally very different, maybe this doesn't help progress. So maybe we can uh, hear first the opinion of our earlier career member here. What do you think? Could it be a barrier sometimes, the very different, too many differences? Uh, I don't think so. The language uh, wouldn't be a barrier uh, in that case. So it's the, it's the language is when you, could there be a communication issue? When we try I, I, to create, like the Tower of Babel, GPT. for example. <laughs> I want to bring up chat GPT because I hear really smart people in high level positioning saying, well, you know, AI is going to solve these problems. And those of us, my research area is an AI. And, I, and, and those of us that are trained, it, we just cringe because we know that if you feed it garbage data, if you get in millions of people to put in some myth, that's going to become fact and you will change history. You know, you'll say this event really never happened because these, you know, these, these the conspiracists say this never really happened. If you can get enough crappy data, right? Because nothing better to call it in there. So, you know, it, it is communication because people say, well, I'm data driven. And I, they believe, you know, we talk about fake news and we want data. Where is the validation? Is a lot of these people, when I talk to them one-on-one -on -one about um, when I went to Dubai, Dubai and India have more women in engineering than the U.S., like 40%. The U.S. is like 20%. And when I went there to talk to the women in there, you know, about their careers and even, um, but I did love it that they, they stand up and they greet the professor when you come in here, I got to <laughs> beg them to be quiet, but they, it was amazing how the culture was accepting of women in engineering because they, um, the women in Kuwait helped convince uh, the women in Dubai to educate girls because it made the family unit stronger. So connecting the value at the level or the importance to the cultures and the people you're responding with corresponding is, is really fundamental. Yeah, I, I think culture is important and it's, it's grounds uh, human beings. I think what, what I, well, what I know is, is that oftentimes um, we perceive that there's some degree of, um, uh, there being at odds to come from one culture to one culture. The truth of the matter is there are foundational um, values that exist across all cultures. And I think once we have at least some kind of a, a criteria that we all can look at, we all can at least come to terms and agree, then we can have the conversations and the dialogue, right? The discourse, uh, as opposed to the discussion, which is this banging up against each other in terms of when we speak with each other, we need that dialogue. And so that's what I hope we can get to is developing uh, opportunities where we recognize the cultural differences and that's fine. That's what makes the human experience so special 
Um, but not seeing that a cultural identity or a cultural experience or any other identity is somehow, somehow at odds with someone else's identity. It should be this appreciation. How do we build on that? But I think we've got to come to terms, as you said, with a common criteria. I mean, as scientists, we know that there are certain criteria that we have to agree on in order to be able to do certain uh, experimentations. And for me, you know, I look at my grandson as I did my sons. They're doing, they're testing and they're tasting and they're, you know, they're looking at how do they manipulate their environment? Isn't that what scientific mindsets do? They try to figure out how does this work? How do I uh, affect my environment in a way that I can have control? And to me, that's the identities of all humans to have that curiosity. Um, but somehow we, we somehow lose the ability to value that and again, see the human potential, how we grow all of those opportunities, irrespective of them. Well, thank you so much. So we would have loved to continue this discussion as DEI is such a big field and it's never enough to uh, discuss different aspects of DEI, but we would have to like wrap up the session. Uh, so let's thank all our speakers for their insightful discussion.